before his presence. your life. It's been a rough couple of weeks, two weeks. Jose buried his mother. My friend Paris buried his mother. My uncle Merrill, my cousins, will be burying my favorite Aunt Claudia tomorrow. My best friend is fighting cancer. My friend Cleo, his sister had a stroke and a heart attack and is on a ventilator for who knows and how long. The psalmist says in Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death. Rewind that. Walk through the valley of shadow of death. I don't run through the valley of shadow of death. Because in Psalm 70, he also said, Make haste. When God shows up, he shows up in a rush. Things happen. Because in Psalm 91, he said, 1,000 will fall at my hand and 10,000 at my right side. I don't fear nothing. It's been a rough couple of weeks. That's where I've been. But Jesus, Jesus, Jesus kept me in the midst of it all. So I'll come here with you today to worship the one person I know that can fix it all. Father in heaven, be with us, be in the midst of this. May we be better when we walk out than we walked in. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen.
that can never come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free. And my shame is unknown by your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, fall well down. Come and touch these places. 
Hallelujah. Yes. Salvation and glory. Lord, I believe in one. 
said it best let everything let everything if there's breath in your body let everything if God woke you up this morning and started you on your way let everything if you can move your left and right foot let everything if you can lift up your hands let everything if you are allowed to turn on your lights and the lights came on, let everything. If the doctor gave you a clean bill of health, let everything. If the doctor gave you a bad hill of belt, let everything. David says, let everything that has breath. If God put breath in your body, you need to praise him. If God started you on a mighty long way, you need to praise him. Let everything that has breath. Even when I don't feel like it, let everything that has breath, even when my kids are tore up from the floor up, let everything that has breath, even when my checking account ain't what it should be, let everything that has breath. Oh, can I get two or three witnesses that can stand up on their feet and testify, had it not been for the Lord on your side, where would you be? Let everything that has breath up. Praise the Lord, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let everything, let everything, let everything that has breath praise Him. Come on, praise Him. Praise Him. He's been too good. Praise Him. He's been too good. Praise Him. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, hallelujah. i like for you this, this afternoon to turn with me to the book of Mark. We will start in chapter 4. We'll conclude at verse 8, the book of Mark, chapter 4. We will start at verse 1, and we will conclude at verse 8. And I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. And the Word of God says, once again, Jesus began teaching by the lake shore. A very large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. Then he sat in the boat while all the people remained on the shore. He taught them by telling stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went to plant some seeds. As he scattered it across the field, some of the seeds fell on a footpath. And the birds came and ate it. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plant soon withered under the hot sun. And since it did not have deep roots, it died. Other seeds fell among the thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants so that they produced no grain. Still some 
Still other seeds fell on fertile soil and they sprouted, grew, and produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even a hundred times as much as they planted. I'd like for you to consider this afternoon using as a subject the heart that tears up the church. The heart that tears up the church. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, it is imperative that you show up and show out in your service. So decrease me, Lord, that you may increase. Hard me behind the shadows of the cross. And that Jesus and Jesus alone will be seen, heard, and felt. And if there be any kudos, if there be any props, if there be any accolades, we will be mindful to give it unto you, Jesus. For you deserve all the praise, the honor, and the glory. Let the church of God say amen. amen. The heart that tears up the church. When you look through the portals of time, you will find great men and great women who had the ability to attract a multitude of people. In the third chapter of Mark, we find Jesus doing multiple things. One, he healed a man with a withered hand. Next, he gave employment to the 12 disciples. I'd like to suggest to you today that who God calls, he equips. That God always gives employment to those he calls and never allows them to be in a position of idleness. Third, we find that Jesus corrects the, sc the scribes when they're accusing him of being possessed by Satan. In chapter 4, we are told that Jesus begins teaching by the lake shore. The gathering becomes so jam-packed that Jesus gets into the boat and takes his pulpit out to the sea to preach and teach the people. If I had time to preach this afternoon, I would have entitled that message, Down by the Riverside. Look at where the people come to meet Jesus, church. They didn't come to the 11 o'clock worship hour to meet Jesus. They didn't come to Sabbath school to meet Jesus. They didn't come to Wednesday night prayer meeting to meet Jesus. They came to meet Jesus down by the riverside. The people that come down by the riverside are sick and tired of being sick and tired. They are in need of a relief to their solution. They are in need of relief to their situation. They are in need of a cure of their affliction, a remedy for their addiction, a prison break for their stronghold. For it's down by the riverside where you will find peace. Can I get a witness? It is down by the riverside that you will find love. And I'm not talking about arrows. I'm talking about agape love. It's down by the riverside that you will find joy, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. It's down by the riverside that we get an encounter with a savior that is willing to give us tools to deal with an imperfect world. I don't know who I'm feeding this afternoon or today, but the solution to your problem is down by the riverside. Can you say amen? But that's not my message this afternoon. The writer Mark pins Jesus teaching the multitude in the form of a parable. Jesus elects to tell a story about the sower, the seed in its soil. I do not know why he selected this subject, but what I do know about Jesus in his word, in his appointment, in his, in his healing, and in his actions, that they're not by happenstance, that they're on purpose, that Jesus has a specific design for what he's about to do. And so in verse 3, he not only introduces us to the sower, but he tells us what the job of the sower is. The sower's main job was to, what, sow seeds. Why? Because he understood that there was a great harvest that must be prepared for the, lively, for the livelihood of his family dependent on the preparation of the harvest. He couldn't put off tomorrow what he can do today. You still there? Come on now. The, 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 the sower could not put off tomorrow what he can do today. He couldn't say, I'll sow some seeds tomorrow uh, rather than sowing it today. He had to do it today. 
So he began to prepare the ground by plowing so that the seeds would have a chance to grow. And there would, and there would be challenges that would arise that could potentially prevent his job from being accomplished. If I was to interview a sower or a farmer and ask what were the main challenges that, that they would face in preparing for the harvest, they would tell you the weather. Mother Nature must be just right for the seed to grow and to develop the fruit of the sow that that sower intended it to have. If it was too hot, the fruit would be scorched. If it was too cold, the fruit would freeze. If there was too much rain, the fruit drowns. If there was too much wind, the fruit is snatched from the ground that it is planted in. If there's a shortage of water, the fruit withers and die. The weather must be just right. And while all that I have mentioned above could happen, the sower knows that he can't control the weather during the sowing process. The sower still goes out and does his job. The sower has a clear understanding that the reward of sowing the seed is greater than the consequence of losing the fruit. You miss that. The sower doesn't get caught up in what could happen because the sower understands that the reward of, of sowing the seed is greater than the reward or, or greater than the consequence of losing the fruit. And so even though he understands that the fruit can be lost because of the weather condition, he still goes out and sows anyway. However, that is the chance that he has to take because he understands that what he gains from sowing the seed is worth the risk of losing the fruit. Let me make it for you. Let me, let me break this down for you uh, clear and plain. 2,000 years ago, Jesus decided that I will leave heaven in its splendor and glory and sow some seed to those that lost. Why? Because what I stand to gain in sowing the seed is greater than the loss of people not accepting my word. Oh, you should have shouted right there. You should have shouted right there that Jesus, that Jesus would sow the seed even though that the number of people who would reject the seed is greater than the number of the people who would accept the seed. Jesus still decided that I will sow the seed anyway. I'm so happy that Jesus doesn't get caught up in numbers. That even when people would decline and reject, that Jesus looked down through the portals of time and said, even if, if only one that's born in Bronx, Lebanon Hospital, August 25th, 1974, if he's the only person that will accept the seed, I will die for him. That's the soul you got. Jesus doesn't get caught up in weather-like conditions. Jesus just souls anyway. Can I get a witness? Christ wants us to adopt that same philosophy. Jesus has called all his sowers of the word. He called us to be sowers of the word in his kingdom. For Matthew 28 verse 19 to 20 states, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even until the end of the world. Amen. But sometimes what happens, church, is we get caught up in weather-like conditions rather than sowing the seed. We will take a nominated position if we know who the leader or the assistant leader is because we want to get along with them. We only support the church with our combined budget if the agenda of the ministration falls in line with our agenda. We take people out of position because they're receiving too much recognition. Can I get a witness? We dig into people's personal life seeking to tear them down rather than to build them up. We complain about all the wrong that's going on in the church and never acknowledging the things that are actually right. The church has lost its focus of the Great Commission. The Great Commission is the sowing seed part. It's to prepare the people for the Great Harvest, which is the Second Coming. We can't prepare the people for the Great Harvest or the Second Coming, focusing on weather-like conditions. Sometimes we have to stand still and say, peace be still, because the reward of the Second Coming is greater than the storm that's currently blowing. 
I know losing your job is, is hurtful. I know that that man that left you or that woman that left you, it's hurtful. But the reward that you stand to gain in the second coming is greater than the storm that's currently blowing. We get so caught up in what's going on around us. Sometimes, sometimes what's going on around you, the storm that's going on around you, is to build you up. God has something better for you. I said this before, I'll say it again. You're not anointed for tr from trouble, you are anointed for trouble. Your anointing activates when trouble comes knocking at your door. When Moses was called, his anointing activated when Pharaoh spat in his face. When Goliath came at David, his anointing activated when he went to attack Goliath. When Cedric, Meshach, and the bad Negro was talking to Neb Nebuchadnezzar, they, they, their, their anointing activated at the, at the fiery furnace. Yeah, he was a bad Negro. Can I get a witness? Your anointing activates when you are in trouble. It's at that time that you look to the hills for when cometh your help. You understand that your help cometh from the Lord who's made heaven and earth. You say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Your anointing activates. And so, Elder Grisby, the one thing that I desire of the Lord is to do his, to do his work regardless of who's with me and who's not with me. Who's with me or who's against me. I, I, I want to be so driven by God that I will look for opportunities to change the environment rather than commenting on the environment. I want to be a I want to be a thermostat, not a thermometer. I want to be able to change the environment. If the environment is negative, I want the Holy Spirit to live so much in me that when I walk into that negative environment, positivity begins to speak. Oh, you're not talking to me today. I want to change environment. I want to show people that even though their that their current predicament does not dictate what God thinks about them, that God gets the best glory when He reaches down in the gutters of New York City, because that's where He found me. Come on now, I, I'm so happy that He looked beyond my faults and He saw my needs. Can I get a witness? And so when we when we when we examine this parable more closely. We will see that there are three type of church or three type of hearts that will tear the church up. The first heart is the wayward heart or the hard heart or the wayside heart. This footpath, or this footpath is along the fertile grounds. It's been walked on so much that the dirt is hard and the seed won't penetrate the soil and remains there in the open only to be devoured by the fowls of the air. In Mark's gospel, we are told that this speaks of a person that hears the gospel, but who does not understand it. That is, they cannot make the connection between the gospel and their own life. They cannot see how the gospel could potentially, could possibly hold value in anything in their life. This person is busy, and this person is a busy and distracted soul. They are so steep in sin and refuse to believe. They are callous and cold towards the things of God and refuses to hear what the word of God says. In other words, the heart, the words of God rest on the surface of their heart, but never penetrates inside their heart. And so as the preacher is preaching. Whereas the praise team is singing, they got their face turned up like they ate a bowl of lemons and hands crossed up and I shall not be moved. Come on now. You say happy Sabbath, what's so happy about it? You walk past them and don't say hello. You can't say hello. Come on now. The Holy Spirit the revival of the Holy Spirit is moving through the church. People are, people are falling out, crying, confessing their sins. People are coming up to the altar in droves and they're just there. What's all the commotion about? Praise team sang too loud. Music's too loud. Elder Maynard preached too loud. Come on now. There's always something wrong. 
The word of God is on the surface of the heart, but it never penetrates inside the heart. Have mercy on my soul. The seed is good, but the soil is unprepared to receive it. The seed cannot penetrate the the soil. The seed cannot germinate. There could be no life in that person. There could be no fruit in that person. This is a picture of a lost soul. Pastor Dog, in my prayer is that I never become that person. That, that I never become a person where the Holy Spirit is falling and I don't, I don't sense it. I don't feel it. I don't know it. I don't ever want to be in a position like Ellen White says where, where Jesus leaves the altar or leaves the throne and he moves and some of his followers notice that he moved and they move. I don't want to be that follower that's still worshiping an empty throne room seat for Satan to sit in that seat and me be worshiping Satan rather than worshiping God. This is serious stuff. I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be hard. When you come to me and you confess your faults, I don't want to always give you scripture. You tell me you ain't got no rent, no, no money to pay your rent. The Lord will provide. Can't stand those type of Christians. Come on now. God will provide just as he rained down manna. I get that. I know God can provide. But maybe the Holy Spirit told me to talk to you so that you can provide. <laughs> See, the hard heart doesn't recognize when the Holy Spirit is speaking to him so that he knows or she knows when to provide. Come on now. And so we have the hard heart person or the wayward heart. The next, the next heart we have, the next heart we have is the shallow heart. This is totally different than the wayward heart. This soil looks ready to be sown. The ground looks good and productive, and the seed cast here will germinate and spring quickly into a promising plant. It will spring quickly to a promising plant, but there's no depth in the soil, and soon as the sun beats down on the tender plant, it withers and dies without bearing any fruit. The word shallow is defined as lacking in depth or knowledge, thought or feeling. The shallow heart believer is an emotional hearer that makes an emotional response to the presentation of the gospel. Perhaps the person hears the gospel and says, this is what I need. I, may, I might as well give Jesus a try. Perhaps they came to the altar and prayed because a friend or a family member did. Maybe they called on Jesus to be their pilot and in the moment of their crisis, but abandoned him once the turbulence ceased. Perhaps the praise team sang the right song and the preacher preached the right message and they got all emotional. They got all caught up in the inside. Whether that situation was, whether, whatever the situation was, the joyful acceptance of Christ is not real because they have not considered the cost of following Christ. They are attracted to the blessings or the benefits of God, but they are not considering the persecution or the suffering of following Christ. You see, this type of believer, when, when everything is going well, they want to accept God. They want to worship God. They want to they want to they want to be part of ministry. But the moment adversity comes knocking on their door, God then becomes the focus of their disgust. It's God's fault that I lost my job. It's God's fault that this person left me. It's God's fault that I can't get that, 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 that house. It's God's fault that I failed that subject in school. It's God, it's God, it's God, it's God. But they're only attracted when God put the money in their bank account. When God gave them a brand new car. When God gave them a man that had six pack. Or the woman with the cola, Coca Cola bottle shake. Come on now. They love God then. 
When they had a couple of zeros at the end of their, the, come on now, they love God then. But the moment that the enemy comes and takes away. And so we got we to gotta covet within ourselves that we got to be like Job Christians. That when adversity comes knocking at our door, we can say, though he slay me. Naked I came into this world. Come on now. And when people are trying to get you to curse God, you can look them in the eye and say, you speak as a foolish person. Should I accept the good of the Lord and not consider? Come on now. We can't be so caught up. We can't be emotional Christians that wherever the wind blows, that's where we go. Come on now. We got to be, we got to, we got to, there you go, plant down. Come on now. Thank you for preaching the word of God, whoever that was. We got to plant down and say, it doesn't matter, Jesus, what happens. I've decided that I'm going to stick with you, whether it's good or whether it's bad, whether I'm up or whether I'm down, whether I'm happy or whether I'm sad. You've been too good to me, Jesus. I don't want to be an emotional Christian. Now, I want to have emotions. I want to be able to cry because I feel the Holy Spirit talking to me. And telling me I love you. For I so loved you on King that I died. And that I gave my only begotten son that, that if you believe you would not perish but have everlasting. That's how much I love you. I want to have that emotion but I don't want to be the Christian. That when things get, that when, when, when adversity comes knocking at my door. I don't want to be that Christian that begins to question God. Now that's a dangerous prayer. Because when you pray that prayer, you have to be prepared for adversity to come knocking at your door. The next heart is the crowded heart. This soil looks like it's ready to be sown, but underneath the surface, there are living roots and seeds of thorns and weeds. The soil has been tilled and the thorns have been cut down, but their roots are alive and well, just under the surface. When the seed falls here, it springs to life quickly and gives every indication that a good harvest would follow. When the seed spreads to life, so does the thorns or the weeds that were already planted and they choke the life out of the tender plant. The young plant withers and dies without producing any fruit at, at all. This is the picture of a person who tries to have the benefits of the gospel while clinging on to the old life of sin. Without a conscious break of the old life of sin, this person has no chance of being saved. The seed of the gospel cannot survive the produce and produce fruit to a heart filled with other things. The sea will either have the ground or the sin will have the ground. And that's why Jesus says that if you care for the world and this earthly riches and the lust of the things of this world, that, 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 that will spell disaster for your soul. This kind of person begins well but soon fades away having their, having their profession choked out by the sin of the world. For this reason and this reason alone, Paul confesses that we must die daily. That my flesh must be crucified daily. That there must be a physical resurrection in my life daily. And it should not only be noticeable by you. Other people should be able to, to see the fruit or see the manifestation of the fruit growing inside you. David proclaims, create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David doesn't say rejuvenate, revitalize, regenerate, or rekindle my heart. He says create in my heart. And when you trace the word create in the Hebrew, you will find that it is identical to when God created heaven and earth. So what David is saying is create in me the way that you created heaven and earth. Create that heart inside me and renew your steadfast spirit, which means over and over and over again, I need your Holy Spirit to be renewed fresh and anew in me. 
Can you say amen? amen? And that's why God says in Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. For he will either hate one or love the other. Or he will either hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. We want to sing and claim the songs of, of, and the songs and blessings of Abraham. And God is saying, I want to give you the desires of your heart. But if I'm going to entrust you with the blessings of heaven, I have to make sure that the world is not inside you. Because if I entrust you with the blessings of heaven while the world is inside you, you will contaminate the blessing that I have in store for others. Your job is not for you to get income and to take care of yourself. I, I know some of you believe that your job is, you got that job because of your education. But, but there's somebody at your job that needs to hear about Jesus. And so God strategically puts you in that position so that you can tell somebody about what Jesus did for you. See, the problem is, is that because the world is so inside of us, the problem is, is that when we get into the workplace and the boss puffs our head and tells us how good we are and how the company can't move without you, that's a lie because as soon as they fire you, they're going to sit there and continue on doing what they can. Come on now. Hey, I work for GameStop. I tell you right now, if I get fired tomorrow, one thing that I can promise you, the gates of GameStop will open back up again. And so the world, the world makes us feel like, makes us feel all warm and fuzzy on the inside, making us think that we can't, that they can't move without you. And then we forget about our mission. We forget that God put us in that position to be able to save, to be able to show support, to be able to encourage, to sow seeds of encouragement. We forget about that. And God is saying that I want, the, I want my spirit to be so re do, deeply rooted in you that even if I take everything away, you're still just as committed to me as you was when you first got baptized. Anybody remember when you first got baptized? You remember when, how many times you read the word of God? Remember how many times you prayed? You prayed when you got out the bed. You prayed when you were in the bathroom. You prayed when you got out the shower. You prayed in the kitchen. You prayed before you ate. You prayed when you walked out the house. You remember that? Now what happens? God be happy if he gave one prayer before you eat. And that prayer before you eat is a quick one. God is grace. God is good. Thank you for the food I'm about to eat. Amen. Come on now. God is saying that I'm not looking for people who have the world. I want to put a seed in you that's going to be able to be so infectious that those that get connected to you will automatically be contaminated for the good. So those are the hearts that tear up the church. Elder Grisby, I can stop right there. I can leave them on the hearts that tear up the church. Musicians, you can come if you're ready. I'm done. I'm done, Elder Grisby. I can go sit down right now, Elder Grisby. Now nah, I'm a gospel preacher. I got to give you some good news. Can I get a witness? I can't just leave you with the hearts that tear up the church. I got to give you the hearts that multiply the church. I got to give you the heart that builds up the church. I got to give you the heart that sets the church on fire. And so Jesus talks about this heart that, that talks about the seed that fell on good ground. Elder Brown, I'm hoping that that's me. I hope that when, when Jesus is sowing seeds that he, that he looks at new life and he says, hmm, that's good ground. Come on now. So, so, so he begins to sow good and some seeds fell on good ground. This was the ground that had been worked and prepared. It had been plowed and tilled until it was ready to receive the seed when it came. This seed germinated within the soil and the plant began to grow. When the plant uh, reached maturity, it began to produce fruit and brought honor and gain to the farmer. This is the picture of the heart of the person that is deeply in the word of God. They are tilled by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's in this picture that they've been worked over and prepared for over by the grace of God. It's in this picture that they understand that they must not just be hearers and doers, he hearers of the words, but they must be doers of the word. It's in this picture that they understand that profession equals application. They live what they profess. I'm going to say it again. They live what they profess. 
they understand that their perfection is not comes not by their works, but it comes by the lamb that was slain. They're not happy where they are spiritually. They don't say, I've arrived. They continue to press to the mark. They continue to pray. They continue to study. They continue to pray. They know that they're not a victim, but that they are a victor. They don't accept the mindset, woe is me. They accept the mindset, why not me? <laughs> it's this heart that knows that the race is not given to the swift, nor to the strong. It's this heart that knows that they should not be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. This heart knows that they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This heart knows that they have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor the seed begging bread. This heart knows that all things work together to good for them who love the Lord. This heart knows that there is now therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but after the spirit. This heart knows that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. This heart knows that if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. All things have been passed away, and behold, all things become new. This heart knows that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from our unrighteousness. This heart knows that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power in a sign mind. This heart knows that if I'm consistent and I'm persistent with, with my walk in God and I do everything that God requires of me and I don't follow God by convenience, this heart knows that on that great day for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall be raised from the grave and we that will remain shall be caught up to meet him and so shall we ever be this heart knows that if I go to prepare a place for you I come again to receive you to myself that where I am there ye may be also and so church the question that I want to propose to you this afternoon which heart do you want which heart do you want do you want the hard heart the one who has the seed of God sitting on the heart but doesn't penetrate the heart do you want the shallow heart the one that's ready to serve the Lord with all of your heart your mind and your soul when everything is good but the moment that adversity comes knocking at your door we can't find you do you want the crowded heart the one that springs up and bears a, a, a promising plant. But because you didn't deal with the root of your sinful condition. When your seed generates fruit, so does your thorn and your weed. And I've come to the realization that there's nothing here on earth that's worth losing heaven for. I'm doing a Bible study with a group and we're, 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 we're studying heaven and the author says eyes have not seen neither ears heard neither enter into the hearts of man the things that God has in store for you so I want you to close your eyes or open your eyes however you want to do it I want you to think what do you think heaven is like paint the best picture of heaven I'll even allow you to go to the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Or go to cribs. Go to pimp my ride. 
and use that as an analogy to figure out what heaven is like. And I'm here to tell you that heaven is a million times better than that. You telling me I can go to a place where there'll be no more crying? You telling me I can go to a place where there'll be no more sickness? You telling me I can go to a place where foreclosure and repossessions are out of business? You talking about a place where I don't have to pay bills because the lamb that was slain, come on now, you're not talking to me today. The lamb that was slain, his blood is sufficient. Come on now. This is what I want. And so like David, I say, Lord, creating me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit in me. If you got to take my cable away, take it away, Lord. God, if my job is causing me to miss out on your kingdom, give me a new job. If my neighborhood is causing me to get in trouble, relocate me. And so church, I don't know who I'm talking to, but this one tore me up from the floor because I see aspects of my life in the hardened heart, the shallow heart, and the crowded heart. I don't see a whole lot of me in the good heart. And I'm saying, Lord, I'm drawing a line in the sand. I need, I need to manifest the characteristics of the faithful heart. And so if you're like that, if that is you, I ask that you come forward and you pray. You're praying, Lord, I need that good heart. I don't need some of that good heart. I don't need a little of that good heart. I need all of that good heart. I need to forsake the hard heart. I need to get rid of the shallow heart. I need to get rid of the crowded heart. If that's your desire, I ask that you come forward.